Hello beautiful people, my name is Vendi and today I'm here to bring you the Art of Books tag. As you can sort of see by the change of background and surroundings, I am at my kitchen table and I've got a taped off ukulele, some art supplies around here because I thought that if I'm going to do a book tag that's talking basically about different art supplies and what you do with them, I might as well be doing a little bit of art and I have a secret Santa sort of thing going on with some of my friends and I thought that this would be a really good way to incorporate those two things together since I need to do this anyway, might as well film a video about it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I was tagged to do the Art of Books tag by my friend Katie from the channel A Sea of Tomes just about a full calendar year ago now. The tag was created by the channel Tome Infinity and I'll have both them and Katie linked in the description box below. And as I've already said, this is essentially a book tag where each of the prompts is based on a art material and a technique that goes along with that material. So there are 10 questions. I've got a ukulele to paint, so I figure it's best if, without further ado, we get started. So we're going to start with question number one, which is colored pencil. For this, the technique we're going to say is layering. So colored pencils layer gradually to build an image using several colors. Uh, what book has several complex layers to the plot? And for this, I'm saying... The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. If you've been following my channel for a little bit, then you already know that Priory was one of my favorite books of the past year. And no small part of that was because I thought the world building was just an absolute masterpiece. But in addition to loving the way that Samantha Shannon crafted the world, I was equally as enthralled, or perhaps even more so, with the many different peoples and, and motivations and, and interactions that shaped the plot. Whenever you have a book with as big a scope as Priory, uh, and as many key players, all of them are obviously going to have uh, their own things and goals that they are looking to do, things that they are looking to avoid, and sometimes those things clash, and other times they work in concert, but the real sort of point of it is that um, as the writer you need to make sure that they all are given a good amount of, of weight and importance. Otherwise, you just have a story full of plot holes, and that's no fun to read. Um, and I think Samantha Shannon not only had a gazillion layers to her plot, but I think she handled them in a, in a very masterful way. I just thought that the way that she interwove those various um, goals and intentions was really masterful. I'm sorry if I'm a little less uh, articulate than normal. I find it difficult to both focus on what I'm doing here and talk. Perhaps this wasn't the best idea, um, but I am having, gosh, just so much fun. <laughs> Prompt number two is charcoal and blending, and I think that's really fitting uh, given what I'm attempting to do right now. Blending is done to create smooth transitions between the light and the dark. What is a book where the light and dark blend to each side? For this prompt, I'm choosing The Savior's Champion by Jenna Moresi. Well, I mean, it's a mixture of very dark, grim fantasy where people are bleeding out left and right and people are dying, um, mixed with a really tender, beautiful love story. Prompt number three is pen and ink and cross-hatching. So parallel lines are drawn at different angles so that the spacing and the thickness of the lines creates the illusion of volume. What is your favorite series with the most volume? So this, I'm choosing a series that is still ongoing. The Witchland series, starting with Truth Witch by Susan Dennard. If you've been on my channel before, you've heard me talk about The Witchlands. It's my favorite uh, ongoing fantasy series, perhaps my favorite series uh, ever, bar none. Set in a world where people have different abilities tied to the four elements and also to uh, the void and the ether. Uh, those people are called witches. During the story of The Witchlands, we are following a absolute variety of characters from all across the eponymous witchlands, as their countries come to the end of a 20-year truce and begin the stirrings of war again. Meanwhile, two best friends, Sophia and Isolt, a truth witch and a thread witch, realize that the two of them might be the mythical Kar Awen, the twin chosen ones destined to save the witchlands from 
the end of magic and other sorts of greater peril. So there's a lot going on there. At present, The Witchlands consists of four volumes, but there's going to be, I believe, at least two more books, which will bring it up to an even six. So the next prompt is marker and permanent. So markers are known for making permanent lines. What is a book that's permanently drawn in your mind? And I mean, there's really no question for what this answer is going to be. What could I say except for Peter Pan by J.M. Barry? In talking about Peter Pan, I really don't feel moved to make or to give a synopsis or explain what the book is about, you know what it's about. It's a classic. Everyone knows the story of Peter Pan to some degree or other. It's sort of a universal staple as a children's story. Uh, it's known and beloved by people of all ages, uh, from the youngest readers to the oldest. And it's a classic. It stood the test of time. People have been reading it since it came out and they haven't really stopped. So. I think it's definitely uh, got to be my answer for this. Um, and in addition to its massive societal importance, it's my favorite book of all time. Uh, I think you get something new out of Peter Pan every single time you read it. It's just my absolute favorite story. I know that there is a whole lot of problems with it um, on so many different levels, but it is the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart. And it's, if I could, wipe any story from my mind and experience it over again. I think I would, except for Peter Pan, because I think that it improves upon reread. I love finding out something new every single time I read it. And there haven't been a time that I've read it that I haven't gotten something new out of it, uh, whether it be because my perspectives changed as I've aged or whether it be, oh, I didn't really read this bit of the text so closely before, so here's a fun, new bit of information that I wouldn't have figured out otherwise. Um, there's always there's always something with the story and I just think that's really cool and I love it so tremendously. The next question appropriately enough is acrylic paint uh, and the prompt for that is vibrant. Acrylic paint is known for its vibrant colors. Pick a book with a vibrant cover or a very vibrant character and I feel like the book I chose for this one um, sort of answers both prompts, really. Howl from Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne-Jones. So most people are familiar with the story of Howl's Moving Castle uh, because of the Studio Ghibli movie, which is fair, but I prefer book Howl to movie Howl because he's even more dramatic. He's even more finicky and anti-hero-y and, and absolutely ridiculous. I think he's a very fun, whimsical character. He's got a penchant for for the outlandish and the and the great and magnificent. Um, so I think he's the perfect choice for this prompt. Uh, the next prompt is watercolor and the prompt that goes along with it is wash. A wash is a technique that basically creates a translucent layer uh, on the paper. It's usually used for doing backgrounds uh, with watercolors or anything where you have to do a big flat even coat of color. What is a book that had a sort of transparent plot? And absolutely no shade, but Red Rising by Pierce Brown. Listen, I really liked Red Rising. I like the whole of the trilogy, but to say that the plot was crazy unpredictable, particularly for Red Rising, uh, would be dishonest. In Red Rising, we follow our main character, Darrow, who is a red on the planet of Mars. Um, he lives in a society where people's social status is codified by their color, which isn't just a symbolic thing. People are literally uh, bred to sort of be the color that their caste is. It's, it's, it's wild. It's many years in the future. Humanity has conquered like all of space. So what Darrow does is he basically decides to join the revolution. And the way that he's going to join this revolution, the way he feels he can make the greatest impact, is by allowing his body to be experimented on. Uh, so he's basically put through a system of training that turns him into, physically, a gold. And as a gold, he's given an alias and uh, a sort of backstory and stuff. And he is going into the sort of training ground 
that the Golds put their children in to figure out who is going to end up ruling the galaxy because it's not entirely a birthright thing. You also have to prove your mettle uh, through this challenge. And from there, it's essentially like the Hunger Games in space. So I knew how it was going to go because that's how these stories have to go, which doesn't mean I enjoyed it any less. It just means I knew it was coming. And sometimes getting exactly what you kind of expected is ideal in a book, you know? You don't always have to be left guessing to enjoy a thing. After watercolor, we have oil paints and the prompt for this is texture. Oil paints are thick and they keep their shape the result of this is that they build the illusion of texture. What is a character or a creature that you can't get out of your mind because it was developed so well? And for this, I have to say... The Indomitable Evelyn from The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. There's not much to be said about Evelyn Hugo that hasn't been said a hundred different times in a hundred different ways already. The book was a booktube favorite and fairly so. Uh, almost exclusively because Taylor Jenkins Reid created such a vivid, realistic character. I think the, um, like the main search result, uh oh, that's way too much. The main search result uh, for a while when you searched uh, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo is, um, is Evelyn Hugo a real person? That is how well and in depth uh, her writing as a character was. Taylor Jenkins Reid did a, a masterful job of having her leap off the page she, because it almost felt like getting to know a real person. It was, it was wild and a little, almost too close sometimes. Um, but then again, that's kind of what celebrity is and she is a celebrity. So I think it's wild either way that, uh, I think she was just a beautifully done character. And I think Taylor Jenkins Reid deserves like all the accolades, uh, for what she did. So we're actually coming in pretty close to the home stretch now. Uh, the next prompt is digital art, uh, or a new style. So digital art is a fairly recent modern medium. Pick a book that is a fairly recent release. And for this, I have to say one of my favorite reads of last year, one of the last reads I got to uh, in 2019. Maggie Steve Vodder's latest, Call Down the Hawk. I know that some people have a differing opinion about this, but I think Call Down the Hawk was just absolutely beautiful. I personally got everything I wanted out of it, and that is a story about Ronan and Adam, who were my two favorite Raven boys from The Raven Cycle. Adam, my absolute favorite, my child, my son, the love of my life, um, is in college at Harvard now, and he's trying to leave behind a very difficult past. And Ronan, my second favorite, uh, a dreamer, and by dreamer I mean literally a person who can pull stuff out of his mind, which is just bonkers, realizing that he, he can't escape who he is. He has one option, either dream or die. And then both figuring out how to navigate that. And wrapping it up, we have the ninth prompt, Canvas. Oh, no, nope, sorry. The next to last prompt is Canvas. Uh, and the prompt for this is blank. So a blank canvas is the best tool for drawing out a new idea. What book had the best idea? And for this, I'm going to interpret it as what book had the just absolute coolest concept. And for this, I have to say... Once and Future and its sequel, The Sword in the Stars by Amy Rose Capetta and Corey McCarthy. So the concept for uh, Once and Future and its sequel, Sword in the Stars, is, I mean, I can basically pitch it like a gender-bent, super queer, King Arthur retelling in space. And if that's not just the coolest concept you've ever heard, I don't, like we can't be friends. That's, that's hands down the coolest thing you've ever heard in your life. And I know it and don't lie to me. I'm, I'm, I'm right and you know it. But what I really love about Once in Future is that it's more than its concept. It's all well and good to have like a really cool elevator pitch. Like obviously that's gonna be a really good talking point, uh, great for your sales and marketing teams. But the content of the story is really what I as a reader am looking for. And the content of Once in Future is just, it's so good. The pace is absolutely breakneck. So just be aware of that. Know that it's gonna go faster than you think you can keep up with sometimes. But there's so much heart in those books. Um, and it's, it's really a revolutionary 
duology in that open queerness is a revolutionary act and anti-capitalism is a revolutionary act and this book has both of those things in spades it's just god it's so good and the final prompt uh that i'm not a huge fan of uh, is scrap paper so not every doodle is meant to become a masterpiece uh, sometimes you just grab a piece of scrap paper and start to draw and it's all right but could be better and the question for this is what is a book that you think should have been scrapped and reworked and i mean i look i get that it's asking me for personal opinion and that you know reading is a subjective thing and what i might think is a terrible book might be somebody's absolute favorite thing ever written but you know what who am i to to say that something somebody put probably years of work into ages of rejection and revision who am i to say that that's not the right version of that story who am i to say that the story can be improved upon i can dislike a thing but to say that it would be better in a different way uh and that i am somehow the the all-knowing all all-seeing all-powerful uh, person who knows what that way is it's just so presumptuous um and i truly i could never and i would never um so i won't do you know what i mean because like that book if it's published if i read it like it got published it sold i have a copy of it so obviously it sold who am i to say that i can make it better i've not sold anything you know, I've not published anything quite yet. So making some statement about like, oh, it would be better if done this way is just, I don't know. I don't feel qualified, nor do I feel like good about making that kind of a statement. So again, I will not, I refuse. Refuse to answer your, your, your baiting question, uh, creator of this tag whose name escapes me. I'm just kidding, you did a really good job making this tag. I had a lot of fun doing it. And now that I finished the tag, I'm going to finish this painting. So I'll see you guys in a minute to show you the final project. Hopefully it'll be good. God, I hope it's good. I hope she likes it. Okay, so it's been a minute, but the back is just about done. Um, I finished up the little galaxy. There's this pretty little moon and just a whole nebula going on. This is a little better look of the back for now. I know it's all awful looking texturally, but I'm gonna Mod Podge over it when it's all finished. Um, Here, and now I'm going back to finish work on the front. We have a little bit of a galaxy print in the shape of an octopus, but I'm gonna make it look a little more detailed. Um, yeah, so not long left now. I'm having a lot of fun. So it's the next day because I decided to wait and make sure everything dried up before showing you the final product. And here it is. Let me show you the front. It's a little octopus. And the back, this is the finished galaxy. I'm, I'm very proud of this. Uh, the reason it's still taped up and the reason I'm holding it by this is because I still want to get a really nice clear coat of varnish on it over top of the Mod Podge just to make sure it's really waterproof and properly sealed so it's still a playable instrument. Um, I don't want this little octopus to get super scratched up after the hours of work that went into him. Um, I'm very proud of how this went and I'm also very proud of my art and books tag. Thumbs up and if you like me, maybe consider subscribing to my channel. I post bookish content every weekend and I would love for you to become part of my little YouTube family. Comment down below if you've read any of these books or if you do some kind of art. I always, always love talking to people who share multiple interests of mine. I feel like that's the easiest, easiest way to make friends. And I would love to talk to more artsy bookworms. I think that would be a really, really fun thing. Also, let me know if you enjoyed this sort of content or if you would enjoy watching more artsy videos of mine on YouTube. This is an old love of mine that I fell not out of love with, but out of sync with a little while back. And I've just recently gotten back into wanting to and being able to do like visual art again. And I would love any excuse to do it. So if I can double it up with my book too, please let me know. 
uh, and I'll be sure to post more videos like that in the future. Thank you guys again so much for watching, and I'll see you again with a new video very, very soon. Goodbye.